Thanks very much. And okay, now that, let, let's get started. So it's, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Gordon Semenoff all the way from the University of British Columbia. I'd like to thank him for, for getting up early to talk to us today. Uh, he's gonna tell us about uh, graphene at the edge. And before he starts, let me just remind you of the discussion session that will follow. It's an extra special discussion session uh, today. So I hope uh, you'll, you'll stay around for it after Gordon's talk. So take it away, Gordon, please. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thanks to all of the organizers for the uh, invitation uh, to speak here. And uh, today what I would like to uh, do is uh, share a few simple thoughts, uh, which go into a work in progress uh, about uh, boundary field theories in, in graphene. And these are gonna be very simple things as uh, you'll see, but uh, uh, out there in the uh, nanoscience world, they're actually important things. Uh, so maybe there's something one should pay attention to. Uh, and there's there should be things that uh, field theorists have to say there. So on that side, uh, uh, there's a the potential for doing something non-trivial. Uh, so uh, let me begin by reminding you a little bit about what graphene is. Uh, this is somewhat motivated by the discussion session, which we'll have after this, uh, maybe to draw more of you into it than might otherwise uh, want to participate. So graphene is a particular kind of material that's made up of a one atom thick layer of carbon atoms that lie on a hexagonal lattice, uh, which looks something like this cartoon here. And actually the electron microscope pictures of it, which can even resolve the lattice spacing, uh, end up looking uh, not much different from the cartoon. Uh, the carbon atoms sit at the sites of the lattice. Uh, they have uh, four valence electrons, three are kind of bound up in these strong bonds to neighbors. And the fourth one is uh, more free to roam around. Uh, one usually models this material by assuming that it's uh, weakly bound to one of the sites. And then the model, actually the simple model, which describes uh, a lot of the phenomenology of graphene is just this tight binding model, which I've written in the Hamiltonian on this page. And all it does is it takes into account the tunneling of an electron that you would put at a site here. I don't know why this is unstable, but an electron that you put out of site here to one of its neighbors. The hexagonal lattice isn't the Bravais lattice. In fact, it's a superposition of two Bravais lattices, which are triangular in this picture. Uh, the two sub lattices are the sites with black dots and the sites with white dots respectively. Uh, we're not gonna need to remember what these vectors are and so on. I'm just giving you this picture to sort of show you what it's like and how it's modeled. Uh, so this is a very simple model. It's basically free field theory on the lattice. So uh, uh, Solving it is trivial, it's translation invariant. So you begin with a Fourier transform and then uh, it's simply diagonalizing this hopping Hamiltonian. It's very useful to use a two component uh, formalism for the fermion uh, where one component lives on one sub lattice and the other component on the other sub lattice. And uh, that of course steers us in the direction of uh, Dirac fermions. The solution of the theory, the spectrum of the Hamiltonian has two energy bands, which are depicted in this uh, famous picture uh, from years ago already. Uh, uh, so these dark objects above and below are the energy bands. There's a particle hole symmetry through uh, reflection through this gray plane here. And the uh, these bands touch at discrete points. Uh, this is actually something fairly generic in this dimension for this kind of Hamiltonian, something with a complex off-diagonal hopping amplitude in two dimensions, a complex function, which is two real functions of two real variables, will generically uh, have uh, uh, 
a pair of zeros. And indeed, in the Brillo one zone, there are two inequivalent places where these bands touch. Moreover, charged neutral graphene has the negative energy states, this lower band completely filled. In other words, it has a Fermi surface right at this degeneracy point. Then near the degeneracy points, the spectrum looks relativistic. In fact, there's this other famous picture where we chop off the upper curved parts of the spectrum and replace them by some high energy cutoff. And we do that to, to keep this regime uh, where the energy spectrum is linear and looks like the spectrum of a massless particle. Indeed, uh, with the spectrums like this, uh, what does this mean? Well, graphene is like a graphene electron is like a photon. Every electron moves at the same speed, this Fermi velocity, no matter uh, where it came from, what its initial conditions were, uh, or what's happening to it. And this graphene speed of the graphene electron, though, is not the vacuum speed of light. It's uh, actually quite a bit slower. It's uh, about a factor of 300 times less. That's still pretty fast, but, uh, but uh, uh, this, this is actually an important fact when we're trying to model something like the Coulomb interaction, uh, because the speeds of light uh, uh, of electromag actual real electromagnetic light and the graphene electron are different. So to describe this dynamically, one uses this A and B sublattice uh, idea to make a two component spinner. And then one looks in momentum space near the degeneracy point. There are two inequivalent ones. So here I've labeled them K and K prime. Then these spinners, I label them by the upper index that's in brackets here. Sorry about that little instability there. I don't know what's causing that. Uh, I don't know why that happens. Uh, in any case, if one writes the spinners like this, and uh, for the sake of applying this Hamiltonian, makes it into a four component object, the Hamiltonian is, uh, is then also linear in the momenta and looks just like this Dirac Hamiltonian here. Notice that it has two sub Hamiltonians, one for the K and one for the K prime point, and they're not quite the same. But we could make them the same by simply flipping around the uh, two sublattices in this second valley Hamiltonian. So these two species are called valleys, and the up and down components are the sublattices. For the first one, the up component is A lattice, down is B. But when I flip these over, it'll be the reverse for the second one. And this is the relativistic uh, Dirac Hamiltonian that uh, governs a lot of the physics of graphene. Now, actually, so, so uh, in this first formula here, I'm just flipping around these two components. So when I do that, both of uh, these spinners have the same Dirac operator. And, and that's sort of a convenient way to do things uh, because uh, then the SU2 valley symmetry uh, is, uh, is just uh, is simply manifest. Right, so uh, as well as two valleys, uh, of course, we're talking about electrons. So electrons have an intrinsic spin and two spin states. And that again, doubles these degrees of freedom. Uh, and that gives you four uh, different two component spinners. And in our relativistic language, we will call that SU4 symmetry. Now, all of this was seen early on, already many years ago in the physics of graphene. Uh, the experimental work that really galvanized the attention of the whole community, I would say, uh, was the observation of the integer quantum Hall effect in uh, graphene flakes. In fact, uh, the energy scales in graphene are rather, uh, are rather large. So the integer Hall effect could be seen at room temperature. It didn't have to be cryogenic. I think here, this graph comes from the first reference up here. 
These were published in back-to-back -back papers in Nature uh, a, a very long time ago. This graph comes from the first paper here, uh, and you can see the integer Hall effect very clearly. The inset up here, I think, is what this looks like at room temperature, where you can still see the first steps very nicely, and even some of the other ones, you know, they're somewhat fuzzed out, but not completely fuzzed out. So the thing that uh, was new and different about this integer Hall effect is encapsulated in this formula down here. Uh, first of all, there's an offset of the integer in the integer Hall effect by a half. So you could see at n equals zero or density equals zero, filling fraction zero, which is right here. You're in the middle of a uh, Hall step, right? I should say uh, between uh, between plateaus in the in the middle of a step. Uh, that's because for a relativistic uh, Dirac electron, there's a Landau level right at zero energy, and so at charge neutrality, that Landau level is half filled, which puts you in the middle of such a step. So it agrees perfectly with this. Then our SU4 symmetry is also apparent here with a factor of four in front that you just simply have a fourfold degeneracy of the relativistic electrons. Of course, with stronger fields and so on, there is a tendency to break the SU4 symmetry spontaneously, especially in Hall physics, where you have these very flat bands, which are extremely susceptible uh, to uh, even very weak interactions. Uh, and so even that was a rather interesting bit of uh, physics and something which uh, we're going to carry over here to the edge. So I'll put off discussing it much until we get, uh, uh, get to some uh, edge physics. Okay, so uh, we have our sheet of graphene with uh, SE4 symmetry and two spinners. You might then model uh, by your Dirac Hamiltonian or in a Lagrangian formalism by a massless uh, relativistic field theory living in two plus one dimensions. So psi is a two component spinner, uh, in a sense, a spin a half representation of the SO21 uh, uh, Poincare or Lorentz group. And, the, uh, and it also carries a four-dimensional fundamental representation of uh, SU4. But it is a massless field, so it also has scale invariance, which one would expect to be promoted to the full conformal group uh, of uh, two plus one dimensions. Now, that's all very nice at the non-interacting electron level. But of course, uh, this material lives in the real world, and there are interactions. And these interactions are generally non-relativistic. Uh, they might not be scale invariant. They're generally not scale invariant. Uh, and they're definitely there. But if you look at what's actually seen in experiments, uh, this is ARPA's experiment. Actually, I don't remember whose experiment this is. I should have really put the reference here. Uh, but this is also a rather old data. You see these beautiful Dirac cones, which uh, with what looks like a very linear spectrum over, over a very large dynamical range. Uh, there's a nicer picture here. This is from uh, the Lanzara group in Berkeley. And they were actually looking for a deviation from uh, linearity of the spectrum. Uh, so the middle curve here is the one to look at. Uh, the theoretical prediction they were trying to match has this thing curved a little bit, and the dots are their data. And I would say they didn't really find the deviation. Uh, they claim to, so maybe there is some statistical evidence for a deviation, but that looks pretty darn flat. And this is up to more than an electron volt in energy. And things tend to go bad at very low energies in the millivolt range, uh, where, uh, where impurities and things like that uh, tend to mess up this nice physics. And the band starts to curve 
uh, back again uh, to give that uh, funny shape of the two energy bands. Uh, it should be actually more visible than it is in this picture already uh, at an electron volt, but uh, it depends on the accuracy you want. I think to 1% or something, uh, uh, one electron volt is a fairly safe energy. And that's actually a huge band of energies. A millivolt to an electron volt is, you know, from uh, 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 a few degrees Kelvin up to 10,000 degrees Kelvin in temperature. So in that temperature range, the thermally excited electrons and graphene uh, know nothing but this uh, rather scale, uh, scale uh, covariant looking spectrum. Now, every graphene piece in the world has finite size and it has an edge on it. And so one might wonder about the uh, physics at the edge. If there are boundary conditions which uh, are reasonable for our Dirac theory and so on. Uh, and this is a, something that's been investigated a lot. And in fact, there are two rather interesting edges as well as a whole bunch of others. Uh, the two I've uh, shown Martin, in this picture here. Yes, can I interrupt for a second? Would you like to take questions during your talk or do you want to put them off to afterwards? I see we have a hand up. Anytime. Christian, I see your hand up. Why don't you go ahead? Hear me? Barely. Can you hear me a little bit better now? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so I remember there was this old puzzle about exactly what you just talked about in bulk graphene, just before we go on to boundary effects about the fact that the Coulomb interactions are naively uh, you know, uh, enhanced by a relative factor of speed of light over effective speed of light for electrons and graphene. So by you know, 300 or so, making them an order one effect, which would uh, naively make this a problem in strongly correlated field theory, not one for which you would expect a uh, good, you know, nice perturbative, uh, almost free field Dirac fermion description. This was raised as puzzle because of exactly the the data that you uh, you flashed a moment ago. Is what what is the status of this from the theoretic from uh, the point of view of modeling graphene? Is this understood? Why the? I would say it's definitely not understood. Okay, so we just take it uh, as an empirical fact that. Yeah, if you add the Coulomb interaction, uh, that breaks the scale symmetry. Actually, uh, this is an experiment to look for that symmetry breaking. Uh, it's a little bit misguided uh, in a sense that, uh, well, what's expected is that this Dirac cone has a bit of a dimple up here in the far mm -hmm. infrared uh, because the speed of light gets a beta function. And then so uh, the you know fixed point of that beta function is where the speed of the graphene electron equals the speed of light. Uh, that's never seen, never even close. In fact, what's seen here is something very close to the speed that you get just from the naive lattice model. And the running, uh, there are claims to observe it. I would say both the calculations uh, by what you've said, they're sort of perturbatively suspect. In yeah. fact, it's worse than order one. It's more like order five. The mm -hmm. perturbation series is growing from the outset. So the perturbative calculations of the beta function are suspect, first of all. And then, of course, trying to match them experimentally should be equally suspect. Uh, but there are some claims to match them. And this was one of them. And you could see that the running doesn't do a lot in this regime because the red curve is a theoretical one and the dots are the experimental one. To me, that looks you know, flatter than what is expected. So flatter than even the small deviation. Uh, why this, what really happens here, I would say is still not understood. And it's not understood mainly because the perturbative approaches are all strongly coupled. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, there has been quite a lot of work, so I might not know about everything. 
for example, people have studied this uh, this problem on the lattice, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, but uh, I would I would say that is still up in the air. You know why this nice looking more or less scale invariant theory in this regime when every interaction it could have uh, uh, would mess up the scale invariance in one way or another. Okay, no, thank you very much, Gordon. Yep. Okay, there are two interesting edges. This yeah. is called the zigzag edge. So the dark line here is the edge. There was one more question, Gordon. I don't oh. know if you want to take it okay. from Maxime. Okay. Uh, so, so, so sorry, I just just very very simple comment, very very simple indeed, because indeed the uh, conformal symmetry scale symmetry is broken by interactions. But I just would like to point out, of course, you should know this paper by Elias et al. It's I'm just looking at it. It was like ten years ago in Nature Physics by Game Group, uh, Novosel of Game, where they found the running of the velocity uh, uh, as logarithmic running velocity of graphene. I mean, Fermi velocity as function of gating of how many um, how dense. Uh, electron system they have. And they found a very nice agreement with, with the prediction from perturbation theory. Also, as you correctly say, perturbation theory should not work here. So at least they match this hourglass-like profile uh, for the uh, dispersion relations of the uh, electrons in graphene. Well, that's indeed true. And uh, I guess that's the thing that I meant by suspect, uh, that they're matching a suspect calculation from the get-go. Uh, there are other competing experiments which don't quite see the same thing and see something quite a bit more complicated. Uh, uh, the best are from the Philip Kim group, uh, who was, I think, at the time at Columbia, he's now at Harvard, uh, where they don't really see this logarithmic running, and, but they see other strange things, which I think have never really been explored since then in any detail. So. Okay, so the two interesting edges are the dark lines here. The top one's called a uh, zigzag edge, and the bottom one's called an armchair edge, and that's maybe motivated by their shape. And these lead to different boundary conditions at the edge, which we'll discuss uh, shortly. Uh, there are, of course, other possible edges. Uh, so this is a nice symmetrical uh, sort of uh, cleavage of a graphene sheet, if you will, which happens to hit on the zigzag edge. Armature edge is even more finely tuned. It is actually possible to make these with very few defects now. Uh, I think some years ago already they were doing this by unzipping nanotubes. Uh, uh, but uh, I think they're even better sort of chemical processes uh, that eat away graphene and make edges like this. Uh, and uh, the armchair is a little harder to make. Uh, at some angles, one could uh, have, you could imagine cleaving graphene at a slightly different angle than this and doing it in such a way that, for example, the last sites are always on one of the sub lattices. So there's a big family of cuts of graphene where you can get various densities of these sort of zigzag-like sites on the edge. Uh, that's been explored in detail and they all in the continuum theory lead to the same boundary condition as this. Presumably the stuff in between is different boundary conditions and this will also be a different one. Here it's kind of easy because you see the ends are all on one sub lattice. So the boundary condition is just that the component of the spinner on the other sub lattice, one of the two components of the spinner that I've been talking about should vanish at the edge. So that's very simple. Uh, here it's not so simple. They should be related to each other at the edge, but it's still not uh, overly complicated. These two, I will argue, uh, give uh, very different results already at the free field theory level. Then I actually don't have a lot to say beyond free field theory, maybe a little bit, which I will come to. Okay, so what about our relativistic field theory? Well, I think it's very interesting to just think about the relativistic field theory away from the context of graphene for a moment. So you just study a, a single species of fermion. So this would be one valley, one spin state, just one two component spinner defined on a half space and massless like this. 
and ask what kind of boundary conditions could you impose at the boundary of the half space so that this is a sensible problem. And of course, the boundary condition that you need is one that doesn't let fermions leak out at the boundary, or that the, that means that the current uh, normal to the boundary should go to zero there. And this is the E1 current of this theory. And uh, in terms of spinners, that means something like this should be zero at the boundary. And if you want to emulate this uh, with a linear boundary condition, there's actually a family of boundary conditions that does the job that's uh, parameterized by an angle here. What you really need is this thing to anti-commute with gamma zero, gamma one. And uh, you need it to be a projection operator, this whole thing together, so that it has half rank and only eliminates one or sort of half of the degrees of freedom of the spinner and uh, leaves the other half uh, uh, free at the boundary. And indeed, uh, this is a legitimate boundary condition as far as I could tell, but it's really only interesting in, in the two extreme cases, one where it's all gamma zero and the other one where it's all gamma one. The second case where it's all gamma one, actually for graphene, it and a parity inversion partner of it will correspond to the armchair edge. And this boundary condition is actually compatible with uh, the conformal algebra. And so this theory with this boundary condition is a free field version of a boundary conformal field theory. The other interesting thing I will talk about, the existence of edge states though, uh, without a magnetic field or something like that, without some doing something drastic here, uh, this, boundary condition doesn't support any edge states at all. Uh, this has been a lot less explored in the condensed matter literature because of course, they're very interested in the edge states uh, for reasons I'll go into a little bit here. Uh, the other boundary condition, the one that uh, would come from the zigzag edge of graphene, for example, here we're just thinking about one species, looks like this, is that the other, edge of this family of boundary conditions. And this one actually violates the conformal symmetry as well as Lorentz invariance. I was kind of surprised and confused by this uh, for a while. I thought there must be a way, but uh, I, I now I'm pretty much convinced that there isn't, but it has this interesting phenomena of edge states, which I will talk about in some detail uh, shortly. Okay, so these are the two I will concentrate on. In between, if uh, phi is at neither of these endpoints, uh, this apparently is neither a conformal field theory, nor is it, uh, nor does it have edge states. So uh, there's a no man's land in between here uh, where these two interesting things don't happen. I'm not saying that those aren't interesting. I actually don't really know how to get the generic boundary condition here from graphene. I would conjecture that it would be by chopping a piece of graphene in some uh, completely unsymmetric way. I know if you chop it in a way that uh, in a sense captures any zigzag edges that uh, it's been shown by condensed matter physicists that you're, that you're in the second sort of zigzag edge boundary condition and, and this this covers it. Uh, but uh, the other ones I don't know about, I will discount them in a second, but uh, just a few more comments. If you had more than uh, one species of this uh, Dirac fermion, you could imagine a more uh, elaborate boundary condition where as well as uh, these Dirac matrices, there was some mixing of the flavors. Uh, that mixing would have to, for this to be a projection operator, be some by some operator whose square is one. Uh, and since it has to be like that, its eigenvalues uh, would be uh, one or minus one. Uh, and uh, using a flavor transformation, one could actually diagonalize it. And so I believe this with a plus or minus sign in front is actually the most general boundary condition uh, 
uh, you could have. Uh, and the, the flavor mixing we will implement in graphene. In fact, it happens there. Uh, 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 but uh, it's not really that consequential. And the two statements I make down here at the bottom of the page hold even if uh, it's included. Okay, uh, to just see uh, what happens at the edge, how the boundary condition can influence the symmetries, I just write down, do a naive write down of the space-time transformations of the Dirac fermion. These are the space-time transformations that you would implement in the bulk. Uh, and uh, I've just kept the ones here that preserve the boundary. So the conformal algebra here uh, would be the, the subalgebra of the conformal algebra in the bulk, that subalgebra which doesn't transform the boundary. So here, for example, are time translations and translations along the boundary, which I will put at x equals zero. So these are translations in the y direction, a boost along the boundary, scaling, and then the conformal transformations, two, of the th two out of three of them uh, don't change. Uh, well, they have the killing vector, which vanishes at x equals zero. And so it doesn't uh, change the position of the boundary uh, are written here. Now, of course, these are fermions. So these operators have a spin part to them. And it's this thing which doesn't uh, always cooperate with the boundary conditions. In fact, for the armchair boundary condition, uh, it does cooperate. So here, if you put x equals zero in these conformal generators, for example, you can see that only gamma one is left which commutes with this boundary condition. So that's why I call this first one a boundary conformal field theory because it's compatible with the conformal symmetry. The other, the zigzag boundary on the other hand isn't. Uh, the gamma one doesn't commute to the second gamma zero. And so the spin part here, the spin algebra isn't, isn't respected by the boundary condition. And so one loses these conformal transformations and one loses the Lorentz transformation along the boundary uh, as a symmetry of the theory. It retains scale invariance, so it's uh, nevertheless interesting in that sense. And I'll talk about it more in a moment. Uh, let me first say just a few uh, naive things about the, the, the conformally invariant boundary condition. Let's say go back to having a single species of uh, fermion. So one could write down this theory. One might want to add interactions here and uh, you could do that. I've thought about doing this. Uh, I, I don't really have anything to say about anything profound that happens there, but uh, one can uh, presumably uh, think about other uh, fixed points of this boundary conformal field or other solutions uh, beyond free field theory. In this particular theory without interactions, it's easy uh, to find, say, the two-point function of the fermion just using the method of images. So here's something which obeys the boundary condition. And from it in this free field theory to make, uh, to study things like the one-point functions. So this boundary condition actually violates uh, the discrete symmetries of the theory, it violates charge, actually, no, it doesn't violate charge conjugation invariance. Uh, it violates parity and time reversal. And so there could be a con psi bar psi condensate. And in fact, there is close to the boundary that looks something like this. Uh, other uh, one point functions tend to be trivial. I'm not quite sure of all the components of the energy momentum tensor. Since it violates time reversal of parity, actually uh, within range of the boundary, I, I warn you, I'm not sure this expression is completely correct, but you can see just by making the uh, current current uh, correlation function that there is a, sort of a zero field Hall conductivity, very much like what you see from the parity anomaly uh, you know, in bulk, for bulk two plus one dimensional fermions, uh, there's a coefficient like this. And then 
I was thinking it goes like one over X, but I had a crisis of confidence in this formula, which I will have to go back and investigate. So take it with a grain of salt, but uh, for sure there is such a conductivity there within range of the boundary, which is kind of interesting. So this is a, yet another example of a, uh, of a simple field theory with a, with a zero field Hall effect in a sense. Now, all of uh, <clears throat> these last few lines actually go away when we double the fermions to make graphene. So there we should put in the second valley. The second valley will have the opposite boundary condition. Having the second valley with the opposite boundary condition will, uh, uh, will actually restore the uh, parity and time reversal symmetries. And so, this uh, zero field Hall effect would become a valley Hall effect, but it wouldn't be visible for something easily accessible like uh, electric uh, uh, charges and currents, for example. Okay, so I'm gonna stop with this brief comment about this theory. And I do think this is something worth investigating and I'm uh, speaking to a, a a, uh, an audience of uh, very clever people here who are experts uh, in this field. So uh, this is uh, the, this is actually uh, you know a real world uh, system which I, I think could be quite interesting and is relatively less investigated. The other boundary condition, on the other hand, the one that comes from the zigzag edge of graphene in real graphene has been investigated a lot. Uh, it was realized in the tight binding lattice model that this particular edge has uh, zero energy bound states living at the edge. You see them already at the lattice and can construct their wave functions and, and so on. Uh, this was realized a long time ago, actually long before graphene was discovered in the lab by this group in Japan. Uh, and this and their ideas about it attracted a lot of attention. I'm not sure if it was in this paper or in a follow-up paper. They also uh, did some mean field theory argument to uh, show that the edge modes, when populated by electrons, tend to be a spin ferromagnet in that the spins of the electrons tended to all align in the same direction. This is purely theoretical, but uh, that attracted a lot of attention because making something with magnetic order in a material like graphene is notoriously difficult. So if there is something like that, it could be used for all sorts of uh, nanoscience things and uh, even technological applications using something called spintronics. Uh, and so this attracted a lot of attention and it comes to a, a later paper here by uh, uh, my colleague Ian Affleck and, uh, and uh, uh, collaborator Xi, who uh, actually proved that the lattice tight binding model for some types of Hamiltonian, the repulsive Hubbard model and a weak Coulomb interaction had a ferromagnetic ground state. And what I'll tell you here is some improvement on this proof to make it a little broader and looking at this from the continuum point of view, continuum field theory point of view. Now, between this paper and this paper, uh, there are roughly 2000 papers written on this subject. So this is not a small subject. Uh, this is a sort of st string revolution uh, scale uh, uh, rate of publication. And so there's really been a lot of work in trying to figure out how these edge states work. These 2000 are more or less theoretical papers. Experimental papers are more like 10 or 20. Uh, and it's only very recently that there are claims that these edge states are, are seen, actually maybe not that recent, recently that they're seen, but only rather recently that they're seen to be ferromagnetic. And they do indeed seem to always be uh, ferromagnetic, which to my mind is rather interesting 
because uh, it means you have a one dimensional ferromagnet. So something funny must happen. Something interesting must happen with spin waves, uh, for example. Uh, and uh, that I'll have very little to say about. Uh, that, that part is part of the work in progress. And I should say this work is carried out uh, the collaboration of, uh, of my uh, excellent uh, uh, postgraduate student, Chauvin Biswas. Okay, so let's look at the graphene case for the zigzag edge. So there you have two valleys, which both have the zigzag boundary condition, but with an opposite sign. And the basis where the Dirac equation looks like this, time derivatives are here, space derivatives are off diagonal. This boundary condition just means that either the top component or the bottom component of the spinner should vanish at the edge. So you can easily solve that Dirac equation. There are bulk solutions, which I haven't bothered to write. They don't look like anything special. There's a little deficit in them near the, near the edge, and that's because there are these edge bound states. Uh, they are particle hole symmetric. There's a, a simple matrix that maps the positive and negative energy bulk solutions onto each other. So the bulk solutions, uh, positive and negative energy states, one-to-one -one mapping between them. And then there are some zero modes. The way to find the zero modes, of course, is to put get rid of the time derivative, replace it by zero, and try and solve that equation with the boundary conditions. And then this is uh, these are just derivatives by the complex combination x plus i y. So the solutions are holomorphic or anti-holomorphic uh, in the upper and lower component. And then you uh, you uh, choose the one that obeys the boundary condition. So for example, with the first boundary condition, which sets the second component to zero, here is a solution for an edge state. And it's not just an edge state, it's an infinite, continuously infinite family of edge states parameterized by this uh, quantum number K, which you could think of as the eigenvalue of the single particle momentum along the edge. So, to, to see this, you make a phase, uh, you, you make an ansatz where the wave function goes like E to the I, K, Y, where Y is the coordinate along the edge. Then a zero mode solution must be like this. X is positive here, starts from zero and goes to plus infinity. So this wave function is normalizable when K is negative. So for all values of uh, negative real number k, we have found an edge state. This means there's a continuously infinite family of them. With the other boundary condition, you just have the anti-holomorphic thing in the lower component of the spinner. And that's normalizable when k is positive, whereas up here it's negative. Now remember, we flipped around these spinners, uh, these components of native graphene. If we hadn't done that, this would be up above. And this would look like it, uh, it uh, in a sense, a family of zero modes where k went from minus infinity to infinity, where you replace this k by mod k. So some discontinuity in the middle. That's sometimes a useful way to look at it. But uh, for now, let's talk about it like this, uh, because these are the conventions that I'm going to be using. So this uh, already brings up some peculiarities. I really apologize for this thing jumping around. I don't know why it does Gordon, that. Gordon, I'm going to yes? interrupt briefly and, and, and warn you that uh, we're getting a little bit late in the hour. So can... Oh, OK. There's a way to wrap uh, things up. How much up time do I have left? Am I out of time to, already? If there's a way to wrap things up in five or 10 minutes, that yeah, would be easy. Yeah, it should be easy. Uh, uh, so let me discuss some peculiarities of this state. So let's say we just had one of these. And we would like to make a state which is charge neutral. Since the bulk states are uh, uh, charge conjugation symmetric, particle hole symmetric, and uh, for the ground state, say, the negative energy states are all filled, positive energy states are empty, our 
charge uh, neutral state would fill half of uh, these zero modes. We'd have to fill half of the zero modes to make a state like that. Now it's not so easy to choose half of a infinite half line. So that's already a challenge. Also notice uh, some uh, other things. For example, uh, uh, these states all have a momentum. So K is like their momentum, but every state we fill has a momentum with the same sign. So if you fill an infinite number of these states, you get something that apparently has a huge momentum, even if these are static uh, wave functions that aren't moving anywhere, they all, uh, they all have a wave number and all the wave numbers are of the same sign. So that's another weirdness, uh, perhaps brought about by the violation of parity reflection sort of along the boundary. Uh, and there's another one that this is a scale invariant theory. And you can see here that scaling X and Y is equivalent to scaling K. And in fact, this normalization changes the, the dimension of the spinner from one to a half in a sense. Uh, but scaling K by scaling K, you can get from any edge state to any other edge state. In other words, a set of all of these edge states uh, is an orbit of the scaling transformation. So if you wanted a scale invariant state, the only thing uh, that would be scale invariant is either not to fill any of these edge states at all or to fill all of them. Neither one of those is charge neutral. And so this is a sort of anomalous thing that you expect uh, perhaps with uh, a single component of fermion. Uh, if you have two components, you might add the other one uh, in that case, you could redefine your uh, C, P, and T. Well, P and T, actually it's all C, P, and T. Uh, those are all violated by having one boundary condition. You could redefine them as interchanging the two valleys and, uh, and therefore restore them. So having the two valleys like uh, you do in real graphing, the fermion doubling actually restores the discrete space-time symmetries and gives you two families of edge states, like the ones that are written here, if, um, if it would stay on this page for me. If you play with the quantum numbers here, though, of trying to make a neutral ground state, a scale invariant state, uh, one that doesn't have a huge amount of uh, momentum, you'll find that those three things are actually incompatible. So a scale invariant state means I fill either all or none of these modes. So that means one of these is filled, the other is empty if I want it to be uh, 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 charge neutral. And then that will have a huge momentum. If I fill half and half, that will never be scale invariant and scaling in fact does something really weird. And as I said before, I'm not sure what half is even so. So this sort of anomaly persists here, at least some of it, but real graphene also has spin. So as well as the two valleys, which are the top row and the bottom row here, there are two spin states, which are the first column and the second column. And spin just goes along for the ride as a degeneracy of the fermion. So my edge modes look something like this. And now I can fulfill my dreams of a scale invariant charge uh, neutral uh, zero momentum state by simply filling this and this and leaving this and this empty or filling this and this, leaving this and this empty. And every other way of doing this is just a, sort of a trivial parity or a time reversal transformation of this. So those are the two inequivalent ways. And I come to two rather nice states. So filled, filled, empty, empty, filled, empty, empty, filled, something like this. The first one happens to be ferromagnetic, like the ones that are seen in nature. The second one isn't. The second one uh, is spin unpolarized, but it also has a very strange behavior in that if you weight the spin by the momentum, it has a huge, uh, in a sense, uh, spin current in it, uh, which is weird, but it still has the other criteria uh, 
satisfied. Now, you might wonder why I'm so worried about these quantum numbers. I mean, I'm looking at a, uh, at a huge space of degenerate ground states here. Any filling of the zero modes uh, of any kind has the same energy as any other uh, filling. And I've uh, selected a few states just based on their symmetry. And that is indeed a legitimate uh, thing to wonder about. Uh, and uh, you might think that, well, a scale invariant state is maybe special somehow. It has lower energy uh, maybe, or is the endpoint of a RG flow or something like that. But I never had a precise argument and was not able to get one until I sort of looked at interactions. So if you introduce a weak interaction, so here I've introduced one in this first uh, line, uh, a uh, interaction Hamiltonian that couples charge density to some two body potential, the charge density again. And actually there are even relativistic interactions that this would cover uh, if this two body potential is say a contact interaction. And that's because these spinners in a given valley only have an up or down component for the zero modes. So when the zero mode part of this actually looks very similar to the zero, mar zero mode part of one of these relativistic looking interactions if you make this a delta function. Uh, but in any case, let me consider not just a delta function, but any repulsive interaction that's repulsive of all at all ranges. It doesn't even have to be translation invariant. Uh, what I need is that for this uh, uh, kernel V of X and X prime to be a po positive definite kernel. So the interaction is always re repulsive. In that case, I can argue that these exact states that I identified on the last page are actually the lowest energy states in this uh, uh, Hilbert in this space of all of the degenerate states, and that includes ones which are charge neutral, ones which which aren't just any filling of the zero modes, and uh, this goes along in a rather straightforward way. The argument is very similar to, uh, to uh, Lieb's proof of, uh, uh, of order in the 1D uh, repulsive Hubbard model. Uh, it uses arguments similar to that. The argument is basically that the charge density uh, itself uh, doesn't annihilate a state like this, but it also doesn't create other excited states from it. It can't. And, and so uh, if you do a subtraction from these operators uh, that corresponds to the, in a sense, the vacuum charge, you find that the zero mode part of this actually annihilates these states and the pieces that are mixed zero mode and non-zero mode and the particle hole pieces all act because of particle hole symmetry like the unit matrix in this space. And, and so indeed you can argue that these are the lowest energy states. Okay, now, okay, this is my last slide. On the lattice, if one goes back to the lattice, there is a subtlety here. And you might suspect that because we're talking about zero energy states, but states which have all wave numbers. And the way we dropped a bunch of the wave numbers when we went to the continuum. Uh, now, actually we do have a complete set of states so it's not like we're missing anything from the continuum theory it, and uh, probably not from the lattice theory actually, but there's a subtlety that on the lattice for the few uh, problems which have been addressed this way, this anti, what I call anti-ferromagnetic state actually isn't degenerate with this one and it isn't, uh, it isn't a ground state. The reason for that is on the lattice, this charge density operator can uh, have uh, what here I would consider very high infinite wave number and can take you, it can mix the degeneracy points, the K and K prime point. So on the lattice, this can have huge wave numbers, which for example, for a Hubbard model where this is delta function is just sort of reabsorbed by, by this other operator in the exchange 
contributions to this interaction. And those are taken into account in my continuum model. If you put them there, what you learn is uh, their influence, of course, depends on the momentum dependence of this potential. For a Hubbard interaction, they contribute something, which is the same order as everything else. So that mean, it would mean if I went back to the lattice, I would discover that this was indeed not the ground state. Even for the Coulomb interaction, it's not a ground state, but the Coulomb interaction falls off with momentum transfer, like one over momentum squared. And so one can use that to argue that even if this is not an exact ground state, in a continuum limit at the scale uh, where you observe the continuum theory from, it has very low energy. And that would be very hard to figure out just from the lattice theory. So our anti-ferromagnetic state here is a very low energy state. So not an exact competitor, but perhaps at times a competitor with this ferromagnetic state. Interesting questions left over here. I'll put in my conclusions. So uh, we've studied the Dirac field on a half space, just in some trivial circumstances, like free field theory. Uh, we found, discussed boundary conditions which uh, typically violate discrete symmetries. And these discrete symmetries in graphene are restored by the Fermi undoubling that happens there. Uh, the zigzag boundary conditions have these interesting uh, and much discussed edge states. Uh, and we've uh, fashioned a proof that repulsive two-body interactions of the electrons of any kind actually lead to singling out particular configurations of the edge states, uh, one of which is a ferromagnetic one, the thing that's actually observed in the real world of zigzag edges. Uh, the other one, not an exact ground state, but uh, depending on the interaction, it can be a low energy state that I call anti-ferromagnetic for uh, various reasons. And uh, it's interesting because here we've made a, one-dimensional ferromagnet, in the sense a one-dimensional quantum ferromagnet, that's something I thought didn't exist. Uh, it might exist for reasons similar to why graphene on a substrate as a two-dimensional lattice exists. Uh, especially at finite temperature, one would wonder if it exists at all, and that's something that deserves further investigation. Exactly how this thing becomes stable, uh, for example, is my next order and perturbation theory going to have infrared divergences in it from intermediate spin waves and things like that? That's sort of an open question and part of the reason why uh, we haven't uh, written this work up yet. But with that, I will thank you. All right. So uh, questions for Gordon? I see one hand up. Oh, Christian. Yeah, thank you for the, the nice talk, Gordon. Um, I, I just have a quick question. Uh, if, if I want to understand what you're doing in the language of functional integrals rather than Hamiltonians and stick, you know, bras and kets, what does the, the filling of these zero modes mean from the point of view of the functional integral? I mean, it sounds like that should be Grassmann zero modes in the, the, the path integral description. Yeah, uh, this is something I haven't thought very much about because I have the general impression that things get complicated and difficult. Uh, <laughs> but yes, uh, something like Grassmann zero modes, and I, you know, there's a continuous, continuous, inf continuously infinite number of them. I, I'm really not sure how you could keep track of that. Uh, although uh, it can be regulated, for example, uh, you could think of uh, your sheet of graphene as rolled into a sort of a big nanotube uh, where the end of the nanotube is a circle with these edge states, and then there would be a discrete finite number. Uh, but in, in a path integral, it's true, there are zero modes of the Hamiltonian, they're static, Therefore, zeros of the Dirac operator. So I guess you're right. There'd be some some sort of uh, Grassmann zero. You know? Yeah, I mean the reason why I'm confused about this, I, you know, how actually one 
regulates the integral is is one thing but the the sort of fill, choosing to fill versus not fill like you you know when we have a functional integral with Grossman zero modes we get zero yeah. unless we insert the zero mode and that that's more the the you know so in in order to get something non-zero some kind of non-zero amplitude in this model I would think that I would need to insert all of these uh zero modes into the the, the path integral and and you know what is that corresponding to uh, to one of these choices that you make? Are there various ways to do this? I, I'm sorry, it's a fuzzy question. I just I think I you're thinking of a dynamical process where these zero modes really would be like some sort of instant on zero modes, uh, and perhaps constrained dynamical process is an interesting way. It's a good point and something I haven't thought about, so I'm not really going to offer. <laughs> wild speculation right here. I, I, I really don't know what uh, happens, but yes, they probably do constrain amplitudes somehow, actual dynamical processes. All right, we have another question from uh, Maxime. Uh, hi, Gordon. Uh, thank you very much for a nice talk. Uh, and I wanted to ask you the question about your um, states, edge states, which uh, appear at the big zigzag edge, which you discussed right now. So um, the question is that uh, those modes, they are very similar to the helical edge modes, which appear in uh, topological, as far as, 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 can, as can see in quantum spill hole effects uh, in quantum spill hole systems in topological insulators. So basically you have spin up going in one direction and spin down going in another direction. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> we know that in those helical modes, when you have two modes counter propagating, so they are really written in this particular, I mean, sim of course, they are not the same, but very similar. And <clears throat> there was a problem there that, in fact, uh, mathematically, if you write them, they look like uh, um, just propagating indefinitely. So the dissipation is two modes, and in the absence of time reversal symmetry breaking. So you have no, for example, external magnetic field, when you have no magnetic impurities, then they propagate forever. However, in reality, <clears throat> if one consider real materials like this, those quantum wells based on mercury, or for example, tungsten detailorite, which is also very good, I mean, single, single uh, layer, which is similar to graphene in that sense, <clears throat> With a big bulk gap, still there, there is a quite short spin coherence length. So it means that in reality, those modes which have to, I mean, in theory, those modes should propagate indefinitely, but in reality, they have kind of spin decoherence length of the order of one micron. It's for actually very low, uh, uh, very low temperature. Um, uh, quantum wells. But if you look, for example, Tansen detailorite, which has comfortable 100 Kelvin, then you have 100 nanometers, basically. So uh, those modes, they have kind of, I would say, they're not only gapped, but they're not propagating too far. So those, uh, those um, the plane waves along the edge, they're not plane waves. They are stopping very fast. So I wanted to ask you whether those problem exists for those modes which you consider in graphene, uh, or it's uh, you can take, for example, ultra clean graphene and forget about those, I don't know, like electron puddles which can appear or some other defects which might appear, some impurities which can scatter back those modes and so on. Well, first of all, these modes don't really propagate, they're just sitting there. So they're a little bit different from uh, the chiral modes say that carry the current in the Hall effect, the mm -hmm. boundary modes, in that those are dispersive actually, right? Mm -hmm. They have an energy which is linear in their momentum along the edge. Mm -hmm. Here, the, these have momentum along the edge in a sense, but their energy is just flatly zero. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can think of them as just sitting there. Actually, mm -hmm. I'm a little confused about that, but through a first approximation, you could think of, you know, superposing these waves to make something that just sits there. Right. Uh, so there's, so they're not counter propagating, and uh, uh, it's a little bit different. This problem. Yeah, yeah, very interesting sense. because because uh, because I have not noticed this. Yeah, very interesting. So they are not so they kind of sitting. They form kind <laughs> of the I would say waves there, but on the other hand, they're not. They they just oh yeah, very interesting, and they but they are very similar. So up to the scale, if you maybe if you remove, for example, this exponential factor, they're very similar. Okay, very interesting. Very interesting. We have an, another question from Andy. 
Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I've been thinking about these things for a long time, so it was really interesting. And I have a lot of questions, but I'll, I'll just ask some quick ones. Um, one was that in the ferromagnetic case, um, are the edge modes in any sense protected by the symmetries? So that, for example, they'd be robust against impurities? Somewhat. Uh... I don't know. I haven't uh, studied this in an informal sense at all. I, I just know that uh, people talk about an island of graphene with, uh, you know, all kinds of junk on the edge, and there's still some density of edge modes. So wherever the the uh, zigzag boundary condition pops up, you have a bunch of edge modes, and I think they're, uh, in a sense, they're protected because they're not propagating right and the things that maxime mentioned they would have to be circulating around the boundary and then uh, of course they scatter from impurities and maybe scatter from each other but these are just sitting there and uh, and so they're quite a bit more stable just dynamically i'm not sure if there's a real topological stability here for example i sort of thought about you know trying to prove an index theorem and you know, just trying to under, understand topological stability. And there probably is an index theorem that describes them. I just haven't found a useful one. So, uh, you know, on that side of it, you know, somehow are they protected by something more than just the Dirac equation? And, and uh, the answer, my answer is I don't really know. Um, my, my last quick question is just in the ferromagnetic states, uh, what operators have BEVs? because something should be breaking the SU2 spin part of SU4. That's well, consist for sure, consistent with scale invariance. Yeah, for sure there would be a spin density, uh, which by scale invariance probably behaves a lot like one in a CFT. It, uh, I guess it would diverge as you come up to the boundary, like one over the distance from the boundary to some power. Uh, other things uh, in, in just the raw, simple free field theory, I think psi bar psi didn't have a condensate for some reason. I, I'm trying to remember what the one point functions were. They're not as interesting here because you don't have the full conformal symmetry, which, which governs, which, uh, which makes correlators more accessible. Uh, but I think for sure there's a spin density. I don't remember that there's a mass operator density. I seem to think there wasn't, but uh, this is all right. I've already, uh, maybe in a few hours, I'll remember things in more detail. Uh, but right now I, I, I don't remember. Uh, there isn't a, uh, in the graphene-like system, uh, uh, it's parity and time reversal invariant. So, uh, there, there's no uh, there's no one point functions for time reversal or parity violating operators. Uh, and this is in the ferromagnetic state. So there would be a spin density. Uh, uh, there might be a charge density depending on the filling, but if it's a neutral filling, then probably no. It's probably charge neutral. I think maybe this is a good place to, to stop, or at least stop briefly. We're gonna have a discussion session in let, let's say five five minutes, let's take a five minute break. But before that, let's let's thank thank Gordon again.